Another Darren story. Um, I was in the earlier stage of the research of this, and I was fascinated by the Nintendo game explosion. I was just really fascinated with it. How was it that, in this, as of last year, I guess there was 30 million Nintendo machines sold into American homes. It's the most popular computer on the planet. There's more of them, and they're coming fast. <coughs> How was it that 30 million of these things got into home? Who was using them, I started to ask. Well, parents aren't using them. The parents are intimidated, they're afraid of them. Every once in a while, they look over the shoulder, but for the most part, Parents don't want anything to do with that. It reminds them of what they can't do in a way that's not comfortable. <laughs> it isn't the older kids. At a certain level, they get into social stuff, and they don't want to play those games anymore. It was little kids. Little kids are playing these. So imagine that 30 million of these machines, and little kids are playing them. So I started to, to become real interested in what was it about these games that made it so attractive that these little kids who are not the greatest force in the universe would get their parents and all this money to align in getting them these things. 30 million of them. So, um, at first I thought, well, must be the shoot 'em up stuff, you know, the different kind of games, the bang bangs stuff. As I went into it, I really started to realize that wasn't what it was. That wasn't, that, were, that wasn't a big deal. I thought, well, maybe it's the multimedia, the graphic imaging. But I found that there was kids that liked stuff that was, that I would have said was much more boring. It wasn't as, the pictures weren't as good, the sound effects weren't as good, but kids liked it a lot better than things that had great pictures and great sounds. So it wasn't that. And I kept traveling. And one day what I did was take my son and his little democracy experiments and, and plug the output of the, VC, of the Nintendo machine into a VCR and put a microphone amidst the kids and ask them to explain to me what it was that they were doing. And then kind of disappeared. Now there's a lot of stories connected with that particular body or, you know, experience of research. Um, some of which I just don't have time to go into. But what I did discover was that it was the nature of these games that the children would be put into an environment that would inevitably frustrate them. Nintendo games would inevitably frustrate them. It couldn't help but frustrate them. And they would get on the edge of being frustrated. And it, I mean, it would really bug them, right? And that when they were frustrated, they were empowered to act on their frustration. And that was the real key to these games. So if you went into them, you'd find that, for example, uh, Zelda was a real popular one. Some of these games have got beautiful stories, great mythological archetypal undercarriages to them. Some of them are real trash, you know, Terminator, blow everybody away stuff too. But some of them have got, I mean, there's a, there's a new kind of Disney emerging in the world. And it has to do with the story mythology of these games. And they're really going to change the world, the way that that works, what that's, the kind of richness that it's, it's allowing these children to have. These games are not just shoot them up, bang them up. They're thought experiments and mazes that can take months to play out. They're rich tapestries of experience that require at each junction the child to be able to use themselves to blow through their frustrations. And the reason 30 million of them were sold is because children are hungry for being responded to. That's why they want dogs and stuff, right? They want to have something that responds to them. And these games respond to them like nothing before in history. So, again, if you look at the, at the way that these games work, is that the first thing that they would do is present a challenge. But a challenge that was realizable or, or, or understandable on the part of each individual child. That the child could actually get a sense of what that challenge was. In other words, if it challenged them at a level that was beyond the child, then the child said, this is boring, and throw it away. But if, if it was a challenge that was anywhere within their range, then they'd take on the challenge and they'd start to play. And as they started to play, they'd go so far into it before they'd get frustrated. And then they'd ask his mom or dad, can you help me figure this out? You know, or other buddies if they're around. And then they'd realize that there was no way to do this except by themselves. And then they would realize that and this is the beauty of the Nintendo game architecture, is that when they come up against an obstacle, they, maybe they don't, they don't know how to physically manipulate something, 
or maybe they don't understand what they're supposed to say or do to get past a word story problem, right? And what they would do is freeze the game playing, and hold it, and then go over to what we call a resource screen. They pull down this menu, and in the menu might be a consulting wizard, a magic ladder, some potions, magic hammer, rope, any number of resources, if you will. And they'd go to this resource and, and or they might have energy too. They got energy and lives, and they, I mean, it's quite an instrument panel that's there. But they'd get the ladder and they'd come back and try the ladder. Well, the ladder doesn't help me here. So they'd come back and try the magic potion, or they'd talk to the consulting wizard. But they would continue, what they learned was that when they got frustrated, how to kind of hold their frustration, jump to a field of resources, experiment with the resources until they blew through that frustration and they feel great and be ready to go to the next one. And it was that cycle of challenge, frustration, creative resource application, and renewal that was underneath the playing of these games and what caused these kids to want to pull into them. <clears throat> it was just, I mean, it was real clear. I invite you to watch any child playing in one of these arcades to see that. I mean, yeah, there's some th thematic stuff, but that's, I'm real clear, that's the ground. So seeing that, <clears throat> and that also was quite a shock to me, what I, wanted, what I want to talk about then is how is it that what these, ki the, what these kids are, have pulled 30 million Nintendo machines into the home for is this kind of responsiveness. When it's all said and done, the fact that they played this game or that game isn't what caused them to be there. It's the fact that they were able to have that experience. If you think about it, that's what you like too. Anything that doesn't sustain the challenge and frustration in some right balance for you bores you. If the challenge is too steep, then you're intimidated and you stop doing it. If the frustration is too long, if you, it's like we did in the cycle of engagement, if you stay frustrated too long and you got no way to do anything about it, you drop out. You say, that's boring, I don't want to do that anymore. This is the right balance of being challenged, frustrated, and acting on all of that which is what sustains somebody's deep engagement in whatever it is that they're doing, they're experiencing.